Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. This is Holly Lyles. I am the state programs team lead here in FTA Region 4. I'd like to welcome all of you to our general manager's webinar. Uh, we conduct this webinar twice a year. Our last one was in November of last year. Um, we do love your faces and love to see you, but we do ask that you keep those cameras off because it tends to mess with the bandwidth of the webinar. Uh, we also ask that you remain on mute uh, when you're not speaking. Um, because we do have so many folks, we tend to have hundreds attend this. We're going to use the chat box feature today for any questions that you have. Uh, we have several people monitoring that chat box, so we will be answering your questions there. We will also have two open Q&A sessions, um, one after Dr. Taylor and Dudley speak, and then one at the end of the webinar. What we will do is if there's a question we feel we should bring to the group or that we were unable to answer in that chat box, uh, the FTA staff will bring it up at that time. Again, please mute your line, uh, turn off those cameras, please use that chat box, and a lot of FTA staff are on, but instead of introducing everybody, but what we're going to do is each person who presents uh, will introduce themselves. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Yvette Taylor, who is our regional administrator. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Taylor, you're, uh, you are on mute right now. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So let me just start again. I wanted to thank Holly for introducing me and uh, say welcome and good morning to everyone. Uh, I wanted to also apologize for me being blurry on the screen. I can see that I am blurry. There's a camera issue and, and I'm working with headquarters to get that fixed. But in the meantime, you're going to see a little bit of an image of me and I, I uh, look forward to seeing all of you hopefully soon in person um, once we began traveling again. Uh, when I echo what Holly said again, welcome to our GM webinar. We have not gotten together in this forum since November. So I am very pleased to be hosting this along with all of our Region 4 leadership team and our staff. I, I do want to take a moment and acknowledge the amazing work that has been done under uh, Holly Lyles and Mike Sherman's leadership. Uh, Roxanne Ledesma, who's behind the scenes, making sure everything is working well. Uh, to our managers, to our legal counsel, civil rights, everyone working very diligently to put together some good information today. Dr. Taylor, you slip back into mute somehow. Okay, testing. Can you hear me okay? Is that you, Carrie? Yes, yes it was. Okay. You're good. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm going to go by myself on the computer. Uh, but I well, was just thinking. Is, this is Holly. Let me say, if anyone is hitting mute all internally, please don't do that because it also mutes our speakers. That might be what's occurring behind the scenes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Holly. Okay, it, it could Keep be. Going. Yeah, it could be that as well. Um, but thank you for that. Apologize for the uh, interruption. But I was just stating that I wanted to say this is a region wide effort in putting together the GM webinar and I want to thank all of the region for staff. Uh, I was acknowledging to the leadership of, of Holly and Mike who, who has done a phenomenal job behind the scenes pulling this together along with Roxanne Ledesma and many others in the region. So with that we have a lot to cover. So uh, if there's no immediate questions I'm going to go ahead and roll into uh, the presentation. Please. All right, so this is just our agenda slide to let you know who will be speaking. Uh, pretty much it will be the Region 4 leadership team today, along with our civil rights officer and regional council. Uh, there will be two opportunities to ask questions. Please put those questions in the chat as you're thinking of them so you don't forget them. Uh, and we look forward to an active dialogue at those appropriate times. Next slide. All right, so we're going to start with uh, just a little bit of our regional updates. For those out there in the grantee organizations that may be new, this may be the first GM webinar that you've attended. I want to briefly just give a recap of who we are in Region 4. We are one of the largest regions in the FTA, and we cover eight states, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
Minister, um, well over two billion dollars, uh, two and a half billion on a yearly basis, over a thousand active grants. So we are very, very much uh, engaged and have one of the largest portfolios again across the agency. Do have uh, a very lean, mean staff. I think we're up to about 35 employees. Uh, we have um, employees also in our remote San Juan office. But just wanted to share with you a couple of new um, staff changes. We have been fortunate enough to bring on a new environmental protection specialist, Mr. Ron Smith, who will be partnering with Carrie Walker and helping you with any of your environmental documents. Uh, you will be hearing from them, I'm sure. They will always say, fill out that NEPA. Talk to us early and often when we're getting ready to engage upon an environmental action. Uh, so we are very pleased to have Ron Smith on board with us. Welcome, Ron. I also want to announce that Dwight Hill, who has been our procurement expert, has also retired. So we will miss Dwight dearly. Uh, we are looking forward to having a replacement to come in soon uh, behind Dwight. But in the event you have procurement questions, I'm going to ask that you uh, reach out to your point of contact in the region and make sure you keep that open dialogue going on with us. As soon as we have a new person uh, on board, we will certainly uh, pass that along to you. I am excited to say that with new bipartisan infrastructure law, we are getting people. And so right now we have been approved for two additional FTEs. Uh, we are hoping to get a few more as we continue to do our assessment, our own internal assessment. Uh, across the agency in terms of the appropriate number of work workforce that we need in each of the offices. But for now, we are bumping up. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that hopefully we can continue to give you the same level of high quality customer service, be there when you need us, and give you that technical assistance that I think is so very important. Uh, currently, we're still in a virtual environment. We have begun to um, go back into the office pretty much only one day a week. Uh, all of that should be transparent to you all because we uh, we feel like it's been really good communications and transparency going on in the past two years with COVID and with the regional team working from home. Uh, but we are starting to slowly uh, go back into the office setting and there are some travel, but it's only on a case by case basis. We haven't really opened it up to business yet. So probably not until the end of the calendar year. We'll take a look at that and we'll see if there will be uh, more travel to come starting at the beginning of the new year. I just want to highlight uh, there's a link in this presentation. I believe we're going to make the presentation available to all of you following the webinar, but the geographic assignments, that is an active link. You can click on that and you can see who's your assigned community planner, program manager in your respective uh, states and areas. Um, so as you know, we typically have a planner and a program manager assigned uh, by state. And we also have our state programs team who work uh, primarily with the state DOT. So just take a look at those assignments, particularly if you're new, to know who your point of contact is in Region 4. Next slide. All right, so here's just a depiction of our organization in Region 4. Uh, this organization continues to grow, which makes me very, very proud. Uh, we're not going to go through the name. I just wanted to sort of show a snapshot. And my goal is that over the next 12 months that that chart will continue to grow, right? And we will continue to do the good work that we do here in the region to help support and to service our girls. Next slide. All right, so these slides, the next few slides are probably not going to be new slides for you all, uh, but I do want to highlight just because of the importance of the infrastructure law, I do want to just highlight some very uh, general information about the law. Uh, I'm also going to reference you all to our website, which is an incredible resource. There's so much good information on our website and it's all very centralized, very easy to find. I'm going to encourage each of you to go and when you have a little bit of downtime, just peruse through that website because you will find a lot of valuable information about the new bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, but the bottom line is this is an exciting time, right? This is the time in history so much money for transit. Uh, we have up to $108 billion for public transit that's going to expand over five over a five-year period to 2026. There's a lot of new funding uh, for state of good repair, low and new emissions, our, our major capital investment grant program. 
Um, and so there's new funding as well as increased funding amounts to some of our existing programs. Um, we will continue uh, updating you all and, and hosting webinars as appropriate to make sure that everyone is informed on the, on the requirements and the, what the new programs are all about. So you can see on the other side of this, this particular slide, the new grant programs, there are four brand new grant programs uh, that were stood up by the bipartisan infrastructure law. On our website, you will find program facts for each of these programs that is very, very helpful. So I'm not gonna go through the details. I'm gonna direct you there, do some reading yourself, uh, try to get up to speed. But if you have any questions, I want you to certainly reach out to the Region 4 staff so that we can help uh, answer any questions you may have. Next slide. All right, so here's that bar chart to just show you the increase, the significant increase in transit funding. So there's been an additional $45 billion that uh, will, be, will be invested into public transit over the next five years. So we are gonna work with you very closely. We're gonna ask you to, if you haven't already, to start planning for those projects that you know are needed within your communities. This is an opportune time for all of us to really do good work for our communities in making, uh, providing more opportunities uh, to move the people throughout the US. Next slide, please. All right, so this particular chart, I know you've seen it before, it gives you an idea of the growth in our various programs, both our formula programs and our competitive programs. And you can see the significant jump from the light blue to the darker blue, where those gains are, are happening under the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so we, again, are really, really excited to see this amount of money to be infused into our industry. We wanna make sure though, that we are good stewards of this additional funding. With more money, typically comes more requirements and, and more oversight, right? And even the OIG will be snooping around and see how are we doing with the funding that Congress has passed for us? So we all want to make sure we understand what the requirements are, that we are in compliance. If there's ever a question, that is the role of our regional office is to be there to provide that technical assistance. Next slide. All right, so I want to just highlight again the priorities uh, for not only FTA, but this administration. And this, I'm going to pause and ask that you please mute your lines. There is a little bit of feedback. You all could please mute your lines. There's feedback. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I want to highlight on this particular chart, not only are these FTA priorities, but it's really the administration priorities. And as you are applying for the, the discretionary programs, which are very, very competitive, I'm gonna encourage you when you write up those proposals and applications, to highlight how your particular project will help to implement one or all of these priorities that you see on the screen. So as you know, safety has always been our number one priority in transportation. So if your particular project is increasing safety in your community, you wanna talk about that in your application. The other priority is modernization, right? We know there's a significant backlog on aging, our aging infrastructure in transportation. So if you're getting ready to invest money or asking for mon more money to invest, you wanna talk about perhaps how that will bring up your assets to a, a state of good repair, uh, how you will modernize it, making it better, than before. So these are really important elements to address putting together, particularly those competitive proposals. Climate is a focus. Uh, I think everyone knows that now we have more money than ever before in the low no emission bus program. This is where we can make an impact, a difference, and help to implement uh, the climate initiative. So I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't already started to do that transition of your fleet, uh, this is the time to start looking into that and looking at the funding opportunities that, that are going to be made available to you. And then the last uh, priority is equity, right? We've always focused on trying to connect all communities, uh, uh, having a, a, a level playing field. We want to help to ensure mobility options for, for people who are in the lower income areas, those with disabilities, the elderly. So again, if your project is targeting those communities or will be providing transit, transit, transportation in those communities, you certainly want to highlight that in your applications. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, so this is just a recap again of what areas changed by the law, uh, the formula programs, the competitive programs, there's changes regarding the planning, the environment, our big CIG program, uh, more emphasis on safety and also on research and innovation. You know, we're still really trying to move forward uh, with these automated vehicles that many of you have already started to charge the way. Uh, so in a nutshell, all of our areas really have been impacted by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Those program fact sheets again on our website will lay out very clearly for you all in general, what are those changes? What's eligible? Who's eligible to come in for those funds? Uh, so again, I'm going to encourage you to take a, uh, some time and read through those program fact sheets, jot down your questions, send those via email or give us a call and we'll talk more about those. Next slide. And this is just a quick snapshot since we do have brand new programs. Uh, this is to give you an idea of how much funding. So I'll just walk through one. Each of them is set up the same way. But if we look at the rail vehicle replacement program, under bill, there's $300 million being made available per year. Uh, it also lays out who's eligible to come in. It can be state or local government authorities to come in for that for those funding. Uh, what are the eligible activities? Uh, if you want to replace your, your rail rolling stock, that's eligible activities. So if you look at each of the categories for each of the brand new programs, you can see again the funding that's been made available, who's eligible to come in for those dollars, and what type of activities can you uh, ask for or that will be eligible uh, for use of those dollars. All right, next slide. And I think this is my final chart to just highlight there's some other changes that came out with the new law. Uh, and just to sort of highlight for you, there's been a change in joint development. I know many of you uh, engage in a lot of joint development. I'm very proud of the work that we do here in Georgia. Marta uh, have a lot of joint development activity that's going on. But the change now focuses on electrical vehicle charging infrastructure. That is now eligible as part of a joint development project. So if this is of interest and you find a partner, third party, uh, a third party entity that wants to join with you, take advantage of this expansion of what's covered under joint development. Other changes are some administrative type changes, uh, particularly in uh, property disposition. You will hear more about that, I believe, under Maggie today, um, where there's been a change in assets with a, a fair market value that exceeds $5,000. So she'll probably talk about that a little bit more detail later on this morning. And then I wanna highlight with the emergency relief program, uh, thank you for all the hard work that you do when there's a, nat a natural disaster that occurs. You all have been phenomenal in being responsive, working around the clock and also being in communications with the FTA when we're dealing uh, with an emergency situation. So I wanna highlight that with uh, Bill, there's been a change that requires now um, the, the uh, applicants for emergency relief funds to show proof of insurance. Uh, and so that hasn't been in there before, but that's one of uh, the new changes. So again, this doesn't touch on everything, but it gives you sort of a, a high level overview. Again, hopefully it's a commercial to encourage you to go and read about more of the details again on our website. And we will have that link for you on the next slide. There we go on the next slide. Here we go. Infrastructure law website. You click on that website and you can see on the left hand side in that on that website, you can see all of our program fact sheets. You can see frequently asked questions, maybe some things you're thinking of someone else have already asked and it's been answered. Uh, you will find recorded webinars that's there. So if you missed an opportunity to have a briefing on certain sections of the law, we have posted the recordings on the website and they are available for you. Uh, you can also there's you can also see that there are um, other information here if you want to reach out with a question uh, there's an email address that you can send your question to that is monitored by a live person uh, typically the region gets involved in helping to develop a response to any questions or inquiries that can. again we are here for you so always feel free to reach out to your fta region 4 contact reach out to any of the leadership team members reach out to me or dudley we do have an open door policy. Uh, we have a, a, a great relationship with all of our grantees. I want to thank you for that partnership and just want to make sure that as we go forward, we continue that open dialogue two way street here on what's going on and how can we make things better.
All right, and in the future, there will be some more webinars that we'll be planning. We'll probably have some more training that's being offered. We'll be reaching out and, and giving you all advanced notification once those have been uh, solidified. All right, with that, I think I now have the pleasure of turning over the presentation to the best deputy at the FTA, Mr. Dudley White, our deputy regional administrator. Dudley? Oh, I'm sorry, Dudley, before you go, got one more. Ah, all right, one more. Here's the last one on the FTA Workforce Development Initiative. I know you've heard about it, but I wanna highlight this because this is another resource for you, right? So we have stood up a transit workforce center, and we have a third party contractor who's operating the center, but the purpose of it is to help you all, is to help our transit agencies recruit, hire, train, retain a diverse workforce. We've heard that there's been you know, concerns with getting drivers. I know that's still a challenge, but for those that you do have on board, if there's additional training that you need, or you're trying to retool some of your employees, this is a a great resource for you all to tap into. So I wanted to just highlight that. Uh, if there's questions, uh, you can, again, look at our website. You can submit a request uh, for any assistance that you may need from this workforce center. But again, it is a wonderful resource. Uh, please, please take it. I think that's really my last chart. Dudley, it's over to you, our Deputy Regional Administrator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, and good morning, everyone. I'm Dudley White, Deputy Regional Administrator here in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's good to see a lot of names I haven't seen in multiple years and a lot of new names. So I look forward to hopefully meeting uh, you guys, hopefully in the next coming year or coming years. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about COVID funding updates, just give you an idea of what we're doing and what our plans are for COVID funding. Uh, a lot of you guys are gonna hear or have already heard from us in reference to uh, uh, trying to get an understanding of how you plan on obligating uh, the remaining available funds for CARES, CRISA, and ARP. Uh, we wanna ensure that there's uh, timely drawdowns. Uh, at this time, I believe we have about 29 of the CARES uh, obligations, 29 grantees with CARES obligations, and we're trying to uh, push that number to zero by the end of the physical year. Because uh, one of the things that we're required to do, and as Dr. Taylor mentioned about our, our websites, um, we have uh, uh, websites that give you COVID frequently asked questions. On the FAQs that STAIR talks about transit systems are encouraged to spend funds expeditiously. So, we are trying to uh, meet that obligation and we need your help in doing that. Uh, as you'll see later, I'll, I'll, throw you, I'll send some numbers your way uh, to show you that we're doing pretty good. We're almost there. We just uh, need to get uh, keep pressing forward and thank you guys for what you're doing as well to, uh, to press forward. Uh, so a number of the uh, outstanding program managers, community planners, transportation specialists, program analysts, financial analysts in Region 4 have already reached out to some of you, to especially in CARES, uh, to, to talk about the unobligated balances and how you can uh, try to get those obligated by the end of September. Uh, there's uh, no, or if you have no disbursement for nine months, we'll uh, reach out to you to make sure those funds, even though they're obligated, we still want to uh, keep them moving in, into the system and anticipate the same efforts for CRISA and ARP. So you can expect us to be reaching out to you as well uh, but right now our concentration is on the CARES funding, uh, trying to obligate all the CARES funding by the end of this fiscal year. Next slide. And this here is just a, a national overview of how we're spending for CARES, Christian, and ARP. Uh, you notice uh, the total obligated, I'm just gonna look at the CARES column, 99%. Uh, has been obligated. Uh, and then as you see, the CRISR is 93 in ARP. And just to compare, uh, give you some comparison from a regional perspective, uh, in the region for CARES, we're at 96%. Uh, we started uh, with 2.6 billion, and right now we have uh, $85.9 million remaining. So we're almost there. Uh, as I mentioned before, 96.78 to be exact. Uh, uh, obligated, uh, so we're trying to again get to that 100%. So if you have unobligated, 
CARES funds. Uh, we see some applications in the system, uh, a lot of applications in the system, so we just want to try to uh, round those off and get those obligated before the end of the fiscal year. So, Chris, uh, we received 570.7 million. Uh, we have 123 million remaining. Uh, that is a 78.31% obligation rate. As you see nationally, it's 93%. And then under ARP, we received in the region 1.9 billion, and we have 60, 698 million remaining, uh, which is about a 63% uh, obligation rate uh, against ARP. So that's just comparison against the region versus natural national. So those who are uh, getting your grants there, we thank you, and we hope that you will continue uh, to to uh, push these these the obligation of these these funds. And two kits uh, on our website, we have two kits to help you uh, for guidance to help you develop these grant applications uh, faster. Uh, we also have the websites we talked about as well, and then again your community planners. Are, are very instrumental in helping uh, develop these grants, so please reach out to them uh, when needed. And a couple of reminders, CARES and CRISA are funds may be used to prevent, uh, respond, or re prepare for and respond to uh, COVID-19. Uh, we, we know that, as you probably already know, uh, one January 20th is the date uh, where we can start incurring costs for that. Uh, we also know that Crystal requires that all CARES funds acts that are unobligated as of December 27th and Crystal funds shall be directly for, for directed to operations unless uh, the recipient certifies that it has employed, has not, and, uh, not uh, furloughed any employees. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, again, there's FAQs that we have on all of this. Uh, and also reach out to your community planners and uh, program managers who can help uh, um, assist you in developing these grants uh, in case you decide to use these for uh, capital expenses. Uh, CARES and CRISA funds are available to expend it, and our funds lapse at the September, in about a couple of years, September 2024, and they are must be dispersed to use seven years from now in 2029. So I'll turn it over to Holly and uh, we'll see if we have any questions in the chat for myself or Dr. Taylor. Wonderful, thank you, Dudley. Um, Roxanne, did we have anything we needed to bring to the group today from that chat box? Hi, Holly. I added the link to the Workforce Development Center and there was also a question on the All Stations program and the link is also in the chat. There's no other questions. OK, wonderful. Thank you. So we can turn it over to Keith Melton. Uh, thank you, Holly. It's great to be on this morning. Hope everyone is doing well. My name's Keith Melton. I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development for Region 4. We have a staff of community planners and environmental protection specialists to help you with grant development and grant review. We are looking at elig eligibility of uses, feasibility, uh, pre-award reviews on NEPA and things of that nature, tip and step documentation, et cetera. In a typical year, we will review 400 to 600 applications and award 250 to 350 applications. So streamlining and, and saving time is a big deal for us. Next slide, please. All right, grant reminders. You've probably seen a few of these before. Uh, we're trying to clean up trams, and we ask that you delete any old placeholder applications that you may have created that you do not intend to use. Please also note that SAM registration or system for award management now required by OMB, uh, civil rights, uh, expired civil rights documents not in review status, and certs and assurances that are not signed by both the agency official and the attorney can be a hard stop in our process. Uh, please add your designated recipient letter if you are a designated recipient in the TRAMS recipient profile. This will save you time, it's a one and done, so you don't have to keep adding your 
uh, designated recipient letter to each application that you submit. And you can reference that in the executive uh, summary. Also, please note that the section of statute drop down box is very important in our system, especially for discretionary funds. If you have any doubt about what the correct section of statute is, please reach out to your community planner. Uh, we need to make sure that the section of statute is always correct. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about executing your grant awards within 90 days of award, especially if you have selected pre-award authority. Next slide, please. As mentioned, we're trying to uh, save time and I do want to remind folks that you can use super grants. Uh, a so-called super grant is uh, allowing multiple formula funding sources in the same application separated by projects, one, two, three, et cetera. Uh, this is primarily a formula uh, funding uh, opportunity. You see the, um, the programs there on your screen. Please note that um, CARES, CRISA, ARP funds may not be placed in a super grant. They must be standalone because of the accounting issues. With 182 transit agencies, if every transit agency were to submit at least one super grant with formula funds, we could greatly reduce our grant workload and save you time. I understand we are up to about 58 super grants in process or already awarded in fiscal year 22, so we thank you for, for that. Also, if you're prone to place uh, multiple years of funding in separate applications for the same formula program, we ask that you not do that. Um, that really, really increases our grant review workload. Um, you can put multiple years of the same formula funding in one application, and we ask you to do that so we can we can save uh, review time. Uh, next slide, please. OK, rel relatively new uh, this year, the Office of Management and Budget uh, OMB has executive summary requirements in every application. Uh, you see the five elements there. Um, purpose, activities to be performed, expected outcomes, intended beneficiaries, subrecipient activities, if applicable. Uh, please note that the executive summary award description is now available publicly in USA spending. So we want to make sure that um, we have the best executive summaries that we can. Uh, next slide, please. All right, also um, TRAMS is, uh, can be a challenging portal and your user managers or your, your guides to help you through it. Uh, the agency user managers play a key role in TRAMS. They can assign and reassign most of your agency roles in TRAMS. Your user managers will have to be recertified annually. I believe we've already completed that process uh, this year, thanks to Nelson and, um, uh, gosh, um, Frederica, I think. So failure to recertify your user roles in TRAMS can delay your applications. And uh, so we want to make sure your user manager is on top of your roles in TRAMS. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Getting close to the finish line, executing a grant award in TRAMS. Just a couple of reminders. Um, a user designated as the recipient official will receive a task to accept and execute your award. Once executed, the award will move into the post-award phase. Note, and this is important, if pre-award authority was selected, TRAMS will generate a task for an initial uh, federal Financial Report, or FFR, after Region 4 makes the award, but prior to execution by the official. This initial FFR must be completed by your recipient organization FFR reporter before your official can execute the, dram, the, the grant in TRAMS. Um, this is off, often a, a place where um, 
tasks get lost and people um, don't execute in a timely fashion, and then we reach out to try to find out what's going on. So please be aware if you select pre-award authority, you've got a step to uh, complete before your official can execute your award. Next slide, please. The bipartisan infrastructure law also made a number of changes to the big capital investment grant program. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you have a, a project in the CIG pipeline in project development and you want to advance into the next phase of the process, please note that the next annual report uh, review date is Friday, August 26th. That's coming up pretty soon. So if you have a, a CIG project and you're looking for uh, a rating or an annual report, please reach out to your pre-award manager uh, and, um, and let them know. And there's a lot of information on the uh, CIG program on the FTA website, and you're encouraged to go there. Next slide, please. All right, bipartisan infrastructure law also uh, produced some information changes for, uh, I'm sorry, TAM, Transit Asset Manage Management and PTAS. I'm gonna talk very briefly about um, TAM. Updated TAM plans are due October 1st of 2022 or four years from the date of your last update. The latest edition of USDOT Conditions and Performance Report calculated a backlog of over $105 billion of transit assets which are not in a state of good repair. Uh, TAM is uh, uh, expected to address that. So the TAM rule requires your agencies to track four high-level performance measures, one for each asset category. The measures are equipment, rolling stock, infrastructure, and facilities, all based on the condition and uh, the age of those facilities. There's also an NTD submission now for, for your TAM report, uh, et cetera. Uh, not to belabor it, um, there's also a tier one, tier two designation. If you're a tier one agency, then you have more than 100 vehicles in fixed route service, you operate rail, et cetera. If you're a tier two, you may be a small agency with fewer than 100 vehicles. Uh, you may be a tribe, et cetera, um, and you can be part of a group plan. Just please be aware, uh, TAM is now a uh, uh, important factor uh, for you every year. Um, also, the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, there's a lot of information online about the PTASP, uh, so-called PTASP plans, their Dear Colleague letters, uh, their links to the website. Uh, there's a, a place to ask uh, questions. I'm not gonna go into that too much, but um, uh, one of the items that's important in, in, in the bill is that frontline employees must be consulted and your plan, your agency safety plan must be consistent with CDC or state health authority um, items on uh, uh, minimum, to minimize the exposure to diseases. Uh, that's a lot of material, so, so that, that's uh, fairly new. Um, so hopefully you're on top of that. And again, there's a lot of information on the website. Next slide, please. Okay, the bipartisan infrastructure law also allowed uh, certain federal highway programs to be flexed to FTA if there's an obvious transit uh, nexus. Um, there's a new carbon reduction program and there's the website link uh, there. There's also federal highway flex funds for transit uh, access improvements bike and pet improvements, et cetera. And there's also a website for that. Um, we, uh, I believe there is also, yes, there's also a webinar today, later today for flex fund information. So that would be a great one for you to, uh, to sign up for. You see the link there and hopefully you can, you can attend. Um, I also wanna mention before we go to the next slide, uh, if, you, if you make a discretionary application, 
to uh, US DOT. It, um, Yvette mentioned the items you could address, uh, the very important items, equity, climate change, et cetera. But also there's uh, something called scalability. So um, US DOT may want to know, because we're almost always oversubscribed, um, that means we get $20 of requests for every $1 of available funding, even now under bill, um, that your project, uh, you have a capital project that is scalable. So that's something to think about. Next slide, please. Okay, planning emphasis areas um, new this year, December 30th, 2021. Um, this administration has laid out eight planning emphasis areas. You see them on your screen there. I do want to mention um, uh, you should reach out, if you're a transit agency, reach out to your MPO or your state DOT and see if there's a role here for your transit agency in meeting the planning emphasis area uh, items within the MPO's long range plan, within the MPO's TIP and the, and the DOT's STIP. Um, complete streets you see is on the list. So if you, if you feel like you have a, uh, a road in your jurisdiction with a transit nexus that could be improved to make it safer for all users. That's basically what a complete street is. Um, you can certainly reach out to your state DOT and see if you have an opportunity there. Um, finally, before I tr uh, transition to the next slide on NEPA, I would like to mention that this will be my last GM webinar. I am retiring later this summer. I've, I've certainly enjoyed working with many of you over the past 16 years, and I hope that you continue to work seamlessly with the Region 4 staff. Thank you. Carrie? Thank you, Keith. I appreciate all that information. Um, hi, Carrie Walker, one of the EPSs at Region 4. Um, we now, as Dr. Taylor stated, have a new EPS, Ron Smith. He has a, an amazing amount of experience, and he and I are going to manage things the way that Stan Mitchell and I did, which is we're kind of interchangeable so that there's no single point of failure if somebody's out of the office. Um, this first slide I wanted to go over, everybody's favorite topic, NEPA. And I just wanted to kind of go through the classes of action. We have at FTA listed CEs, which are those projects that we know aren't going to have any kind of an environmental impact. We have something called a DCE, which is a project that's pretty much a LCE, but maybe there's one or two things that need to be considered that could have some impacts. At that point, we provide a DCE worksheet to be filled out. Sometimes there are special studies like cultural resources, natural resources, traffic. Um, and sometimes we will actually ask that those studies be completed during the DCE process or before we give a class of action because the class of action could actually move to an EA depending on that information. Now, an EA, which is an environmental assessment, generally takes 12 months. It's a longer process. There's a lot more coordination. And then if, and we use that if we're unsure if there are really going to be any impacts or we're pretty sure there are going to be some slight impacts. Then we have the environmental impact statement, which is the big one. That's the one that takes about two years. Um, those require a, uh, record of decision by Dr. Taylor. And basically we go through all of the analysis and then determine, does this project really work environmentally? And Dr. Taylor makes a determination. So the project either goes forward or it doesn't. Um, both EAs and EISs are on the presidential dashboard, which means there are a lot of milestone requirements that have to be met. We don't have any control over those at the region. I will say um, most of our grant recipients have been very good about getting us all of the information that we need up front so we can immediately say if it's an LCE 
or a DCE. And that's very helpful um, and it helps with the timeline for your projects as far as implementation. Now, you know, we have these different classes of action. I do want everybody to be aware that Region 4 is committed to providing the appropriate NEPA class of action. We don't want to give you an EA or an EIS class of action if a DCE is appropriate. Um, we get no points for keeping money back. We want you guys to do your projects. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. And basically, I want to state that NEPA comes down to three questions. What is the current environment in the project area? What are you doing in the project area? And what are the impacts on the environment if the project is implemented? So just kind of keep those three questions in mind as you start focusing on your NEPA early in the process. And please be aware that Ron and I are always available for questions on your project NEPA. Even in your planning, when you're first planning, we don't want you to get to a point where you've gone so far down the road that to make any kind of an adjustment would be difficult for you. So please reach out to us. Next slide, please. And oh, everybody's favorite, early acquisition of property. As everybody's aware, the cost of property has really, it's been hard on the transit agencies. Property values are going up, up, up. Um, private entities are coming in and swooping in and getting all that property that we need for, you know, BRT or um, a new station. So many, so many things can be impacted by this. Now, I do want to state that if you feel like you're going to be dealing with a hardship or a protective buy, that you contact FTA immediately. Contact me and Ron immediately, actually, along with your planner. We want to make sure that everything is by the book, and we want to make sure that it actually fits the definition of a protective buy or hardship. Um, FTA requests proof for hardship that there, I'm sorry, for protective buy that there are any that there are eminent development plans that are incompatible with the grantees plan for the property, such as zoning change application, filed building permits, et cetera. The fact that a property is for sale is not sufficient to meet the protective acquisition threshold. Um, please be aware of that. And there are some activities that you actually can do that won't impact um, any kind of a hardship or protective acquisition before anything else, such as you can do title searches, right of way acquisition cost estimates, right of way relocation cost estimates or relocation plans, right of way plans, exhibits, or legal descriptions, public meetings or hearings, environmental site assessments, which I want to point out are not part of NEPA. It's more of a planning document and appraisals. Those are all acceptable activities prior to NEPA. Now there are some activities that unfortunately are prohibited. Um, any offer to purchase, any negotiation to purchase, any discussion of price. Any commitment to purchase or establishing any conditions of purpose of purchase and any commitment to proceed to settlement. So you want to be aware of those things. Um, it's. It's a very dense subject technically, and I really do recommend that when you receive this presentation that you go to the link at the bottom of this slide. It has a great fact sheet that I think will provide some illumination once you get through the language. Um, and I appreciate y'all listening to me on these few NEPA topics. Are there any questions? Hi, Carrie, no questions on your topic. Okay, great. And now we're going to Robert Buckley. All right, 
Hopefully my camera's coming on here. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Robert Buckley. I'm the director of the Office of Financial Management and Program Oversight here in FTA Region 4. Uh, I just have a couple topics for you today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the recent Federal Register notice that came out uh, with the apportionment. Uh, we'll go a little bit. I'll introduce you to a, a rural transit um, program that was recently announced um, from uh, USDOT. I have a brief census update and then I have some oversight and emergency response topics. So we'll, we'll hit uh, a couple of those uh, really quickly and then I'll be around for any questions at the end. Uh, next slide, Mike. First, so you are probably aware now that the FY22 apportionment notice has been published. All the funding is posted on the website uh, and the funding has actually been uploaded into TRAMS. Uh, what you may or may not be aware of is along with the apportionment um, and the funds that are posted on the website, we also got an apportionment notice that builds a little bit on some of the initial information that came out in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So I've just got three items that I wanted to highlight. Uh, I would definitely recommend um, checking out the, the apportionment notice. It does go a little bit deeper into some of the other new requirements that um, Dr. Taylor spoke about at the beginning of the webinar, but I'm just going to hit kind of the, the top three that I wanted to make sure you guys were aware of. So first, one of the new requirements under the 5307 program is to uh, spend, if you're in a large urban area, is to make sure you spend 0.75% of your urbanized area funds on safety related projects. Uh, this is a new requirement. It applies to all unobligated 5307 funds, so it is not just applying to FY22 money. Uh, and it's in addition to the 1% for security. Um, but it is possible for some of those expenses to count in both categories. Um, some of the examples that are included on the website, uh, improving air, air filtration systems, uh, lighting on transit properties, uh, and uh, vehicle replacements with modern safety features. So those are all things that could count toward this 0.75%. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to make sure I point out to distinguish between the 1% for security, which is tracked at the urbanized area level, this 0.75% is each recipient. That's why a recipient is underlined in the slide. It is not 0.75% of the amount across the urbanized area. It is at the recipient level. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, next slide, Mike. Uh, another new requirement that is built on a little bit in the apportionment notice applies to uh, bus and bus facilities, uh, competitive 5339 and the regular formula 5339 program. Note, it does not apply to Lono, does not apply to Lono. Uh, but if you are purchasing under either of those two programs under five buses uh, in a standalone procurement, um, FTA is going to start asking you why aren't you using one of the innovative procurement tools uh, such as uh, buying off state schedule, things like that. Um, uh, if and I understand it's not always uh, determined, your procurement methodology is not always determined on the pre award side, which is fine. You just include that information uh, in your grant uh, and you can update it during the post award phase with a milestone progress report. It's also not required to do to use one of the innovative procurement tools, but you are probably going to get asked a question and um, include asked to include something in your grant for why you are not. Um, similar to the 5307 requirement, it does apply to unobligated funds, so it does not start with FY22 money. Uh, so you're going to start getting questions from some of your pre-award managers on this as you start transmitting applications. Next slide. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to point out uh, for the competitive 5339 and low no applications, um, applicants must have a uh, must submit a zero emission fleet transition plan. You can see the elements required there. Uh, and then 5% uh, of low no and 5339 discretionary grants um, related to zero emission vehicles also must be used to workforce development activities um, <clears throat> to help uh, unless the applicant certifies that uh, less is needed. Um, this requirement only applies to 22 and forward. So this was not one that goes back in time to any unobligated money that you might have out there. This is only going to apply to um, the more recent uh, NOFO that came out for these programs. Next slide. Um, all the funding is posted on the website, as I mentioned, uploaded in trams. Just a couple tips uh, as you're uh, applying for this money. Um, uh, Keith, we are encouraging super grants as much as possible. We're encouraging uh, applying for multiple years of funding as much as possible. But one thing I want to note with FAST Act and bill funding, so starting in FY22, there are different funding codes now because of some of the original uh, source of the bill money. Uh, and so it might be easier to separate um, your applications uh, for anything before um, FY22 and everything after. Um, but if you do combine them, you are going to have to break them up into separate projects. And again, it goes to some of the accounting codes 
um, that have been assigned um, because of the source of the money uh, from Congress. Uh, and just a reminder, as you're developing your split letters, please, please, please submit those to Rodney Williams, myself, and your pre-award manager so we can have that information in our for our tracking systems. Next slide. Uh, so the rural sur surface transportation grant program uh, was part of a large NOFO that came out from USDOT um, a couple months ago, and the NOFO has closed. I recognize the NOFO has closed. You see it on the slide, it's been closed. But I wanted to, we wanted to highlight it here because it was $300 million uh, for the rural area, and there are gonna be additional um, NOFOs in future funding years. So we, this program, just like the rest of the bill funds, are available through 2026. So this year is not the only year you're gonna have an opportunity to apply for this program. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure um, that um, you are aware that this funding is going to be available through 2026. Next slide. So I promised a brief update on the 2020 census. You're probably gonna wanna hear more information, uh, but unfortunately we're still waiting on the US Census Bureau to release those new uh, uh, urbanized area boundaries. Um, and what we have heard from census is that is not going to happen until uh, December of 2022 at the earliest. So what does that mean for FTA funding? Basically the federal fiscal year 2023 funds, whenever they come out post, October 1 uh, is going to use the same 2010 uh, urban area boundaries. We are not going to use the new 2020 census delineations for federal fiscal year 2023 money. Uh, once we get the new census delineations in December later this year, uh, we'll start doing what we need to do as far as uh, getting that incorporated into, N into NTD data and our uh, formula programs. And you will see those impacts affect your 2024 appropriations from FTA. Uh, we're continuing to work internally to de uh, develop some FAQs. We do have a website um, <clears throat> on uh, uh, available if you have any questions uh, at this point. But like everybody else, we're all kind of waiting with waiting with bated breath for the census to release those uh, designations uh, sometime in uh, December 2022 at the earliest. Next slide. A uh, brief update on comprehensive reviews, not a huge update here. I think I've shared a version of the slide in the past. I want to make sure everybody's aware after the pandemic in 2020, we basically postponed our trying reviews for a year. Um, so anybody who was previously scheduled for a review um, in 2022, you are pushed to 2023. We'll get back on our normal three year cycle starting in 2024. So if you received a review in 2021, you're back on your three year cycle in 2024. Um, we are still conducting all reviews virtually, at least for this year. Um, no discussion decision has been made in 2023 quite yet. Um, and you can uh, review the contractor's manual. It has been updated for uh, FY 2022 on our website. Next slide. I did want to talk a little bit about the ECHO COVID spot review. So some of you are probably uh, lucky enough to have been selected for one of our ECHO COVID spot reviews. Um, in April of last year, we uh, issued a dear colleague letter explaining our thought process for this huge influx of money, really wanted to make sure that we are being good stewards of the federal dollar. So we are doing some uh, extra um, spot reviews uh, virtually on some of the COVID funds. Uh, we did 21 reviews last year. All of those have been completed and we have 20 reviews scheduled for this year. Um, the uh, Those are just now getting started in June. Um, the uh, folks who've been selected for those will start receiving letters probably later this month. Uh, and some of the triggers for that is if there were any issues in previous Echo Spot reports and, and you haven't had a try and, re try and review, uh, we're probably going to come back and make sure that any um, corrective actions have uh, remained implemented. Um, financial findings from previous reviews, uh, and if you had over 10 million in COVID funding obligations thus far, we probably are going to come take a quick look. These are going to continue through 2023, um, and we have not even begun uh, discussing how many folks are going to get them in 2023 yet. So uh, next slide. They have noticed there are three um, recurring findings from these echo spot reviews the first is charging lost revenue to covid grants you cannot pay for a theoretical amount of lost revenue um, based on any sort of projected fares or tax revenue what you can do is use the covid funds to reimburse those expenses that you would have paid with that lost revenue so it's a little bit of a distinction there it has caught some people that we've done some of these echo covid spot reviews with um, so i wanted to make sure everybody's aware um, next slide the other two main issues are, are dealing with 
uh, when are you when are you charging and how are you charging um, some of your expenses? So the first is making sure you are doing the correct accounting for Fairbox revenue, uh, and you cannot charge expenses pre January twentieth of twenty twenty. That has actually caught a couple people as well. Um, your pre award authority date for all the COVID money is uh, January twentieth of twenty twenty. So those are the, the kind of the, the three main findings that have been recurring in those echo COVID spot reviews thus far. Next slide. Um, emergency response reporting. First off, thank you. I, I know I do this every time. I cannot thank everybody enough who provides us with updates during hurricanes, emergencies, uh, the COVID emergency over the last two and change years now. Um, we are entering hurricane season. Um, I'm very hopeful we won't get impacted, but you know the last couple of years have shown that we probably will have some hurricanes that affect um, states in our area. Um, so make sure that we have your current um, contact information. Uh, if you've had recent changes, if you can please reach out to us, uh, whether that's your pre or post award manager, um, to let us know uh, who are the new emergency contacts. Uh, and when you are impacted, we will send out the our normal, um, you know, here's our guidance on emergency um, uh, the relief programs, um, charter rule exemptions, things like that. Uh, but we are looking for updates uh, when you are impacted, if you're having a shutdown service, if you have any damage, um, any emergency protective measures you're taking, um, things like that. Uh, and it's very important to, to document and keep all your expenses. Uh, we do not have an annual emergency relief uh, apportionment, um, but when there are damages, we have gone up to Congress to get special appropriations uh, in the past couple of years. So make sure you keep that documentation on file. Next slide. I think this might be my last slide. Uh, just a reminder on echo access. Um, the echo form reminders, I, I can, you can see those there, limited to three users, two with payment access, one view only. Uh, anytime you have any changes needing to echo, please use our um, echo uh, region, uh, region 4 echo um, email address. That goes to a central uh, email account where a number of people have access and can help you process those echo forms. Um, and I think next slide. Yes, uh, so at this point, uh, I will be available at the end for any questions you have on any of the topics I brought up today. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Maggie Sandberg. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good morning, good morning everyone. everyone. Uh, my name is Maggie Sandberg. I'm the Director of Program Management and Project Oversight. And I'd like to go over a few slides with some reminders and some uh, some new updates. Uh, so just as a reminder for incident to use, uh, if you have an incident to use for um, vehicles and equipment, please come in for um, in advance for FTA um, concurrence uh, prior to use. And for real estate, uh, we do advise that you come in for a consultation. For each of those, we have our incident to use tool. Your program manager can provide that to you, and it's a very easy um, you know, form that you fill out and that will collect and uh, ex really expedite the project. Next slide. Uh, for uh, spare ratio, just a reminder that we are, um, you know, still uh, looking for fleets over 50 vehicles to not exceed 20% spare ratios. And, um, and uh, just, you know, if you have uh, you know, special circumstances where you are uh, purchasing new vehicles and you need to temporarily uh, exceed that, just come in uh, and we can discuss um, just a, a temporary exemption uh, for that for, uh, for, 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 for Dr. Taylor's um, uh, consideration. Uh, next slide. For contingency fleet, uh, reminder, these are uh, fleets, um, vehicles that have met useful life and they are put in a contingency for emergency use or other um, unforeseen uh, conditions and uh, they should be properly stored and maintained. Uh, and they do not um, add to your spare, uh, spare ratio calculation. Next slide. Uh, when uh, considering for changes to your grants uh, and considering whether to do a budget revision or grant amendments, 5 to 10 does have a description of each one. Your program manager can certainly uh, walk you through the changes you need and advise on which one. Uh, budget revisions are uh, kept to uh, relatively minor changes to your budget or, or quantities. And then grant amendments are used for when there's a more substantial change in scope in the grant or you're adding uh, a new project to the grant. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, for uh, for real estate, um, the um, the FTA review of appraisals remain at one million, and so we stand by to um, you know to assist you with any any acquisitions um, that you have. Uh, for in-kind contributions of any value, uh, we do require um, FTA review and concurrence uh, for for those amounts, uh, and that's for you know for any and any value of in-kind. Uh, next slide. Uh, our disposition, uh, our, our, our disposition guidance remains mostly the same, um, except for a new, a new big change with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, which we will uh, describe in just a moment. Uh, but basically, FTA remains um, to have an interest for vehicles that have met useful life and that are uh, market value over 5,000 and any any asset that is dis that disposition before useful life of any value. Uh, next slide. So the new change in the bipartisan infrastructure's law, which became um, became effective on November 15th, to, uh, 2021, for vehicles and equipment that have um, met useful life but are sold for more than 5,000. Uh, the recipient cannot retain the first 5,000 and the non-federal share of um, any value above that, but the federal share of any amount above 5,000 uh, does need to now be uh, returned to FDA via pay.gov. And so um, just if you have any any questions, any any uh, vehicles or equipment that is sold after November 15th, 2021, uh, anything that is sold over 5,000, please um, just consult your program manager and we will walk you through this process. Uh, but that is a new um, a new new guidance that 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 we need to follow uh, moving forward. Um, for um, some FFR and PR reminders, uh, we continue to follow a similar guidance basically um, based on risk. Um, so grants that are less than two million and no construction and, and a few other factors, we uh, we do annual reporting and then for um, for everything else that is considered to be a uh, higher risk, uh, we will assign quarterly reporting and the quarterly reports are just a reminder. They are due on the 30th of the reporting month, uh, no matter if that particular month has uh, 31 days. Next slide. Um, for milestone progress report, uh, just a reminder tip: when you update um, a date, just make sure that uh, the subsequent dates, um, as as needed, also get updated so that the sequence uh, of milestones uh, remain um, in in the in the proper sequence. Um, Next slide. For peer performance, uh, also do keep in mind if you do need to extend a, um, a milestone, make sure that if that exceeds the current peer performance of your grant, that you come in for a budget revision to um, extend the peer performance of the grant uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, it The peer performance uh, cannot um, uh, can, you know, cannot lapse, uh, and we do need to keep those current. In new applications, we um, we're establishing to set the peer performance of the grant to be five years past the last milestone date to give um, uh, to give ample time for um, any unforeseen conditions. If there's uh, delays in either. Um, in the implementation of your projects, construction projects, or any procurement delays, and also for final, um, you know, processing as you prepare to close out the grant. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that we will continue to work with you, uh, working with your initial uh, milestone goals and uh, work with you to uh, to do you know everything we can to make those um, to meet those initial milestones and complete the the projects on time, and uh, particularly if a project becoming active, uh, we'll work with you to um, to just try to keep the the projects moving. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so these are the contact information for each of our three offices, and we are here um, to help you with any questions, any follow-up questions you may have today or, or any, any other topic. 
Uh, now our next presenter will be uh, Michelle Foster, and uh, she's our civil rights officer. Thank you, Maggie. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Michelle Foster, and I am the civil rights officer here in the Region 4 office. And I would have to say that um, it has been since COVID that I have had the, the pleasure of meeting a lot of you finally in person virtually. So I really enjoy that interaction with you all whenever I get the opportunity to do so. Um, today, um, we're just going to talk briefly on a few hot topics related to civil rights. I'm going to talk about um, Title VI and um, DBE. So moving on to the first slide for, for Title VI and the civil rights updates. Okay. As a reminder, um, for any new uh, facilities, such as your maintenance facilities, um, your bus, um, facilities, operations centers, those types of facilities, they do require a Title VI equity analysis to be completed before um, the site is determined in the early planning stages of, of your project. Um, you have to ensure that there is no disparate impact based on race, color, or national origin. Um, this this um, Title VI equity analysis is to be completed and included in your normal Title VI program submission. There is no requirement to have a separate approval process for this. There are some exceptions um, that we may have from time to time. Um, one of them would be if there is um, a complaint that's filed with our office. Um, if there is a complaint related to Title VI um, as relate relates to one of your facilities, what we will likely do is to request that Title VI equity analysis from you just to ensure that you did do your due diligence in your public participation in performing that Title VI equity analysis. Um, and also, if it's a highly visible project, we may request to see it, but other than that, we don't normally re request um, those outside of the normal review pro um, process. And again, just make sure that the equity analysis is always included in your upcoming um, Title VI program submittal. And also, whenever you have your core tap review, we do have our contractors to review to look for um, to, to ensure that do that documentation is included. I believe it's one of your interview questions whenever you do go through the core tap um, process. If you had any new facilities within that three year period, um, that is one of the interview questions that they do ask you. Next, next slide, slide, please. OK, it has come that time of year again, um, June 1st. Um, your DBE semi annual reports did come due, and I believe um, most of you have have um, submitted those reports and thank you for that. If you have not done so, I ask that you please submit those as soon as possible. Um, June 1, if your reports are not in, in, in TRAMS by June 1, there is an automatic ding on your um, triennial report. It's marked as a deficiency. And that's simple because I don't have the, the flexibility to grant any types of extensions when it comes to those types of reports. The system is not really forgiving um, for those as it is with um, whenever you have um, a, a DBE program or EO program that comes due. Those sorts of um, programs, I do have a little flexibility um, under circumstances. Um, but with the semi-annual reporting, that is a hard and fast deadline. And whenever you do have your quartet review, um, if there is not um, a good justification, it, it does 99% um, of the time, it does become a deficiency in your core tab review. So just make sure that you, you can get those in on time. And if you foresee that you're going to have issues, I know some of you sometimes do have issues getting access to the system. That is something that is um, a justifiable issue. If there was a technical issue that per, um, prevented you from getting that report, um, submitted by the June 1st deadline. And sometimes um, when you have a turnover in personnel and you have not had an opportunity to 
get your permissions updated to the person who is now assigned to complete those reports. And so that would be something that we would take a look at on a case by case basis during your quartet reviews whenever we um, take a closer look at those semi-annual reports. Um, also, when your next reporting cycle comes due in December 1st, that is the time when you, when you will determine whether or not you have met your goal for the year. If you did not meet your goal, you are required to complete a um, DBE um, shortfall analysis. That shortfall analysis is, is to be completed no later than December 29th. If you are a top 50 grant recipient, you are required to submit that, um, semi, that rather that shortfall analysis to our headquarters office. If you are not a top 50 grant recipient, you are still required to complete the analysis. However, you don't have to submit it. You have to maintain, maintain it in your records. And whenever you have your, your core tap review, that is normally um, the time we do review to, to ensure that um, you have completed that shortfall analysis. And I also want to say that the shortfall analysis should not be looked at as anything that's punitive in nature. It really is your tool to use as your roadmap in case you do have a shortfall and um, you identify the areas, activities, or the lack of activities that may have led to you not um, meeting your goal, and then you go on, you're going to outline um, any milestones and activities that you're going to complete moving forward in order to meet that goal um, in the future. And it can also be determined to, to be used as a measuring stick. If you have several shortfall analysis several years in a row, maybe that's a, a, a signal for you to say, well, hey, we, we have not been able to meet our goal. Maybe we do need to make some adjustments. So that's that tool is your is your working document. And again, it's not meant to be primitive in nature, but for to um, give you more tools in your toolbox to help you in achieving your um, for your goal attainment. Um, let's see. Next slide. And finally, I just want to talk just a little bit about the, the ferry system DBE requirements, and this is a very hot topic as of lately, and, and this only applies to those of you who do have um, ferry um, boat projects and new ferry bills that are on the horizon. You do, you do, rather you are required to have a, uh, a, a DBE project specific goal for any of your new uh, ferry bill projects. And the reason that is, um, based on um, regulatory requirements and how FTA views fair, a ferry, um, technically a vehicle, um, traditionally whenever you are doing any type of vehicle procurement, you can only uh, procure vehicles from uh, manufacturers that have been certified um, through the TV, the certified TVM process. Well, there are no um, certified shipbuilders for TVM purposes. So therefore, because of that, um, and based on, and I think I did give reference to 49 CFR 2649, I'm just going to reference that real quick, that as a recipient and with FTA approval, um, you can establish a project specific goal for DBE participation in the procurement of transit vehicles in lieu of the process of which for TVM requirements. So in this case for ferry systems, you will have to do a, a project specific goal because there again, there are no um, certified TVMs in the shipbuilding industry. And that project specific goal must be submitted and approved by FTA before the RFI is issued. So in light of the uh, um, this being such a hot topic lately, what we're asking from you, um, for those of you that this does apply to, and I've already heard from some of you grant recipients, to identify if you do have any current ferry bill projects that are um, on the horizon. And we are in the process of developing um, a ferry project webinar 
in order that we can give you the proper technical assistance and guidance um, so that you can be successful in these projects. So I'm asking for the, the ferry systems that we hold those questions because we are going to be um, developing a very comprehensive program to provide the technical assistance that we know that you all are going to need. So um, just ask that you, you know, be patient with us in that until we can get that information out to you. Um, you should have my contact information to make sure I have your proper email address so that when we do have the webinar completed and ready to present to you all, that I do have the proper contact information and I can get this information out to you. And I, I, I believe that's all I have. Um, let's go to the next slide. OK, we have the civil rights resources. And of course, um, these are the links to all of our educational material and all the resources on our website broken down by the subject area, ADA, DBE, Title VI, EEO, and some of the most recent um, COVID-related FAQs. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn the next portion of the presentation over to Michael Miller, our legal counsel. Thanks, Michelle. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I see we're running a little short on time. Um, when Dudley scheduled me last on the agenda, he said he was saving the best for last, but now I think he was just trying to minimize uh, what time I had to make jokes. So uh, let me see if I can get through this real fast. Mike, thanks for moving those slides along. Uh, what I wanted to highlight, I know probably 95 or 99 percent of you folks of the recipients on the call today have executed their fiscal year 22 certs and assurances. So I, I won't really harp on that, but what I will mention quickly is the justification piece. Some of you may have uh, become annoyed at my frequent emails or my requests, but but in the past, uh, many folks to properly execute their certs and assurances have simply you know, filled out the PDF version, signed it and uploaded it into TRAMS. Well, headquarters is trying to move away from that practice. They're trying to focus uh, on having the authorizing official and the attorney go ahead and just pin electronically in TRAMS. So if you're still using the old paper PDF version, what I'll probably do is, what I'll have to do is just reach out to you and ask that you provide a justification as to why the people that signed the PDF couldn't just go into TRAMS and execute or pin electronically. Mike, if you could move it forward. And my contact information is going to be at the end. So if any of this stuff, uh, if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. The mask mandate. I'm sure everybody is aware that back in April, a federal judge out of Florida struck down that mask mandate. So there is no mandate in effect, which means per the master agreement, you have nothing to enforce because the mandate has gone away for now. I think the DOJ is appealing that decision, but they didn't ask for a stay. So that means there is no mandate for you to worry about right now. Uh, next, please. This is just a reminder. I've included a, um, a picture of my vicious Yorkies there at the bottom, just to remind you of the Buy America small purchase waiver. It may be small, but it's very mighty. Uh, I always bring this up in the context of building a new facility, you know, anything where you might want climate control. And I know in the Southeast, especially on a day like today, we all want climate control. I am not sure that there is an air conditioning unit that is actually strictly Buy America compliant. So what I always tell people is if you structure your procurements properly, like if you're building a new facility, either the transit agency or the FTA recipient or the general contractor who's standing in the shoes of that uh, recipient, they have the ability to hire, say, an electrician to do all the electrical work, but also perhaps an HVAC specialist to do all of the HVAC work. And, and I'm hopeful that if that HVAC specialist only does the HVAC work, that will fall under the 150K threshold. And that allows you to use this Buy America small purchase waiver. Again, if you're, if you're in that scenario, if you need help uh, or, or more uh, advice on how to implement that, please don't hesitate to reach out. Mike, if you'd advance. Thank you. Speaking of Buy America, uh, and I'll, I'll make this short, strong, uh, I'll say mainly because we just closed the comment period. So although there's a Federal Register notice out there, and if like me, all you do is go through the Federal Register and look for you know, different notices, I'm just kidding, but you'll see the link there. 
and it will talk to you about the new uh, requirement for construction materials also to be My America compliant. I know everybody out there is familiar with the uh, iron, steel, and manufactured uh, products requirement, but now we also need to focus on construction materials. The federal, this is pursuant to language that was in bill. Uh, the federal register notice actually has a definition of construction materials. It also talks about what produced in the United States may mean, and I say may because based on the comments that were received during the comment period, again, there may be some minor modifications uh, as to the way forward, how we best implement these new policies, uh, again, based on the feedback that we received. So more to come there. I know FTA headquarters is working on some FAQs uh, specifically on this point, but I guess the, the takeaway here is we are in the middle of a, a waiver period. It ends on November 10th, which is the Marine Corps birthday, by the way. But anyway, we are in a 100 day period where this doesn't apply. So if you do, if you miss the comment period, if you do have concerns, you know, as you look through this, don't hesitate again to email me or reach out to me. And if nothing else, uh, I can float those concerns or issues higher and hopefully it'll help us craft a better way forward on this specific construction materials issue. Next slide, Mike. Uh, these are just things I always hit on when given the opportunity. Keep in mind, uh, FTA statutory requirements make the overarching concern when it comes to using FTA funds in solicitations or procurement activities, full and open competition. We frequently get um, questions about sole source procurements. Just keep in mind the standard is full and open competition. Uh, we should start there and usually the end results work out better for the recipient anyway. And lastly, I know Michelle had just uh, ended with, with some specific resources for civil rights, but there are a lot of great resources on FTA's website. Uh, you know, I, I usually go there first myself. If you know how to use Google in a specific site search, you can type in site colon and then say uh, whatever site you're specifically interested in. Do a keyword search that will narrow your results only from, say, FTA websites. It is very handy. Uh, I use it all the time. Again, if you have issues there, don't hesitate to let me know. I think the next slide is my last slide, Mike. Thanks. There's my contact info. This presentation is going to be going out, so you don't have to write it down. It'll be readily available. Uh, that's it. I think we have a Q&A session next. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Roxanne, did we have any questions? Yes, uh, Michael, we have a question for you from Andy. Is there any discussion of waiving Buy America requirements for vehicles given the current and likely extended unavailability of certain vehicles? Uh, sorry, my computer's acting up a little bit. Can't, no, I have not heard any discussion about that. I will note all of that, uh, the construction material Buy America stuff I just mentioned will not impact any of our rolling stock uh, Buy America requirements. So that should come as some relief to, to folks on the call, but I've not heard of any flexibility uh, granted in, as far as our current Buy America regulations or requirements uh, when it comes to purchasing rolling stock. Okay, Thanks, thank Micah. you, Micah. If you have any questions, please go ahead and place those in the chat box. We're gonna pause a moment. Um, we're not gonna open up our uh, speakers because we have over 200 folks and it gets kind of complicated. Um, any questions, please put those in the chat box. I'm just going to pause a moment and see if we get anything else. Thanks, Mike. I have one more question. Um, some recipients are reporting that they had problems with their CNAs, with their executive and attorney weren't able to pin separately. Have you heard of that issue from more recipients? Um, was that? No, I, I have not heard of a reoccurring problem. I'm not going to tell you that I haven't heard of user uh, issues in trams. Uh, it's a work in progress. It gets better every year. So, you know, if you're encountering, you know, situations like that where you physically can't um, pin in trams, that should be part of the justification uh, if you were tracking my conversation earlier. Just to explain, you know, the system's not letting me do it. I'd rather just put something like that uh, in your recipient profile. I forgot to say if you would upload this justification so I can see it when I'm reviewing these grants. But if you're having problems like that, I'd rather just keep moving forward 
and we'll try to figure it out later then then stop the process and try to you know enlist the help desks help if that's not redundant uh to try to fix that you know right away so if if you run into a situation as was just described just upload a justification and we can keep the process moving forward thank you and i can see rodney i can see your hand up if you could please type your question in the chat and i'll address it and we have a question from ken any idea when the NPRM will come out? So this is for for Michelle. Any idea of when the NPRM will come out on the proposed changes to the DBE program? I have some. I'm having issues with my mute button, so sorry about that. We have not given any final word when that that will be. Um, those changes will be when, when that will come out, but we will definitely keep you posted. Thank you. And Rodney, if you're unable to type, you can go ahead and unmute so you can ask your question. Thank you. Um, I couldn't find the chat box. Um, just wondering in, in reference to rolling stock, um, I'm not sure if you covered it, but with the um, um, supply issues and delay in getting vehicles, um, will some of the grant um, period of performance or availability um, be extended? So is either Maggie or Robert, can you grab that question? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time? Yes, um, I was wondering because of the supply shortage, this is in reference to rolling stock, um, because of the supply issues of getting parts, vehicles in, um, the extended time once you order and delays associated with getting those vehicles, um, will period of performance be extended um, for rolling stock for those situations um, or will availability of funds um, be extended to meet the unusual circumstances yes so um if it's if there's no sunset date on the uh on the funds uh we can definitely work with you to extend uh, the peer performance uh to allow additional time you know as needed uh you know for, for the vehicles to arrive if there's a sunset day, such as with uh, build or race, uh, we will uh, also work with you, uh, but we will need to also bring in uh, OST or, you know, depending on the program, we'll need to bring in the uh, the appropriate um, uh, officials, you know, to to approve uh, or to, to, you know, to, to see to see what's possible. But either either way, we'll definitely will work with you. We'll just have to work within within the requirements of the programs and of course involve you know the appropriate um uh officials you know to 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 be able to approve it uh but just just as a standard if it's a if it's a formula grant and there's no sunset date uh that's something that we can uh easily do with you you know within the program manager and and, and myself okay so it sound like competitive grants like 5339 you have to bring in additional um team members to, to address the situation? Uh, well, yes, for discretionary uh, funding, uh, we do need to involve TPM uh, for, for changes to, to the grant. Uh, but, you know, we've done that with various uh, needed changes and we just need to, you know, we just need to have a, a reason and, and we, you know, we can easily work with TPM to, you know, to, to you know, to uh, get, get something approved. So certainly something like a supply chain and delays in, in deliveries, um, that's something that, you know, we have seen over the last, you know, year or, or more. And that's certainly, uh, you know, that, that, that would, that sounds like a, a pretty valid reason. Thank you. Holly, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Roxanne. Um, we have had a lot of questions in that chat box. I believe we have answered all of them. Um, Mike, if you could just go to that next slide real quick. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you go to the FTA Region 4 website, 
Uh, we do have some great training materials. We do create them here in the region. We have toolkits. We have FTA 101. We have some TRAMS training and some checklists for those applications you're creating. Uh, feel free to check those out um, and use the materials, please. There's also some national TRAMS training on the FTA national website. Um, you can also find your ECHO information there. And if you go to fta.dot.gov to our main page and scroll to the very bottom, you can actually sign up for email updates from FTA so you don't miss, say, a Federal Register notice, et cetera. And you can actually customize what you want us uh, to send you. So that is national, and you can go look at that if you would like to. So a lot of materials out there. We also understand that you prefer to speak with us directly at times. So feel free to reach out to your pre- and or post-award managers with any specific questions. Uh, we have gone over just a few minutes. Um, I don't think we have anything else for the group. Uh, we truly appreciate all of your time today. And again, if you have any follow-up questions or need more information, uh, of course, there's our website, but feel free to reach out directly to your FTA contact. Anything else from leadership this, uh, now this afternoon? Well, Holly, I just want to jump on and say thank you so much. Uh, ho hopefully today this has been very helpful, very informative to our grantees. Again, a huge shout out to the Region 4 team for pulling together all of this valuable information. I uh, just want to thank everyone for being in attendance. Hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. And until the next time, everyone take care and stay safe. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.